How's everybody doing tonight? I hate to break up good fellowship, but it is 7 o'clock, and uh, we'll get started on our lesson tonight. We have been uh, going through several of our, I call it, spiritual traits in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, about through 8. And um, we have a graphic here. If, if I'll draw your attention to becoming a godly person. You'll notice that spiritual, these traits or attributes, begins with faith. And so we go up the mountain, we keep climbing to the next one, uh, and then we go to virtue. We've talked about virtue already. I think our next one was knowledge. And then after knowledge is, oh, that's a tough one for me. How about you guys? Self-control. Self-control. Am I the only one that struggles with that? No? Okay. I need to tell y'all a story. Uh, before I do that, though, the Greek word, from what I can tell, is enkratian, T-E-I-N, enkratian. It's basically the idea of temperance. It's used in Galatians 5 and 2 Peter 1. Temperance, or to be mod to moderate, um, when I was a little toddler, probably 12 months, 15 months, something like that, um, I used to have temper tantrums. Y'all ever had one that had temper tantrums in your family? But I would turn blue, and I was a biter. Oh, your two had temper tantrums. I would bite other kids. I'm like, what was wrong with me? I would, I would literally fall down in the floor, turn red, and beat my head on the floor. And so my dad was kind of scratching his head going, you know, what are we going to do? Because he's obviously just in a rage, out of control. So I started being disciplined or punished. So I made an association that if I fell down on the floor and had a temper tantrum, that I would end up being hurt worse. You know, my bottom would hurt. So I learned that rather than flying into a rage and kicking and screaming in the floor, that I would back up to the corner of the wall where two walls came together and slide very slowly down the corner until I was on the floor. And that was my protest. My dad said, hey, at least he's controlled. Um, he's not kicking and screaming. That's okay, you know. So that was how I protested when I was just, I don't even remember all this, but I'm told I did it. So self-control has been an issue for me uh, all of my life trying to control my anger or frustration. I've been known as an adult to maybe throw a tool across the garage. Um, I've done that before. Anybody else? And then just only me? Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, it's something I struggle with. I think we all struggle with something. So as I bring this lesson tonight, I just kind of wanted to say uh, in a humorous way, that I appreciate the fact that I'm studying something to make me more godly, and that is to be self-controlled, to learn to breathe and relax and, and not take life always so seriously. The Bible tells us that the flesh, uh, the body that we're wrapped in, this body of flesh, this carnal appetite that we have, it makes us prone to fits of rage sometimes, outbursts, uh, even profane speech. I don't know if anybody struggles, don't raise your hand, but profanity? I, yeah, I, I know uh, Roy has been very candid and open about when he served in the military. He said, look, profanity was like breathing for me. Uh, he said, I would, I would go into this profane, vulgar speech, and I didn't even realize I was doing it. Is that a pretty fair statement, Roy? All right, and so he had a real struggle to overcome with his profane speech. Uh, lusts, harmful habits, uh, indulging ourselves. That's something that seems to be a big thing in our society now, self-indulgence, self-indulgence. What do we indulge ourselves in? Too much food. <sighs> Better suck in. Uh, too much Comfort, lavish ourselves with comfort. Uh, sometimes we indulge ourselves with too much recreation. Uh, vanity, alcohol, and just pursuing things that make us 
feel good. Can, can y'all relate to that? I mean, that's the society we live in. Watch TV for a little while. Watch the commercials that come on. And they bombard us uh, with all these products that we can indulge ourselves in and pamper ourselves and make ourselves more beautiful. We want to gratify the flesh because it has an inherent appetite. And so part of self-control is uh, learning to say no to those baser things of the flesh. Now, back in, in times past, if you go back into history, there were actually times where people would beat their own bodies. You, are you aware of this? They would actually take a, a, a whip and whip themselves till their backs would bleed with the idea of driving out the evil and, and bringing the body under control. I've been told that in certain monasteries uh, where monks would reside, they wouldn't speak for years. They just didn't speak. They didn't want to be guilty of profane speech, so they chose not to speak. A little extreme, but that was their approach at being self-control. So have we really become slaves to this idea that someone around us must always entertain us? And I would say sometimes the answer is yes in our society. Have we become slaves to the idea that someone is obligated to make us feel good? Yes. Uh, is it all about meeting my needs? In this society, I would say that's probably the case. People from generations ago, maybe in the World War II, uh, Korean War era, people that grew up in that time frame, that wasn't as big a deal. But a lot of times in this generation, we've been raised to think, it's all about me. Finding a person who doesn't feel that way is kind of a refreshing um, discovery. A person who's not self uh, enamored and tied up with themselves, or it's all about me. Uh, one definition of self-control, I appreciate this one website that I found. They state it involves moderation, constraint, and the ability to say no to over um, to our baser desires, excuse me, and our fleshly lusts. So any thoughts or comments so far on what we've brought up about self-control? What Anybody out there want to add something? Maybe I've sparked an idea or a thought or maybe not. Maybe they're like, Tom, you're doing just fine. Just keep talking. Anybody? Oh. Yes, Dennis. Yeah, and, and the message of Christianity is basically we want you to follow Jesus Christ, and in so doing, when you decide to follow Jesus, it means that you have to deny yourself. You're like, say what? You want me to give something up that might benefit me? Yes, uh, self-denial, uh, sacrifice, putting Jesus first, glorifying God, not self. It's like, no, thank you. You know, and people check out and say, not interested. If it's not convenient for me, um, uh, I'm not, I'm not, don't count me in. So it's a challenge that, that we face. Uh, Jim Olinger writes that Philo, a first century Christian Jew, considered to be a brilliant man, observed the Christians and noted that they established self control as a foundation of the soul and then built on let me open my phone here okay they built on other virtues so self-control was that foundation and then other virtue virtues built on that Eusebius noted that Christians through the knowledge and teaching of Christ excelled in self-control righteousness and discipline and virtue thank you Jim really good observation talking about the importance of some of the church fathers back in the first century, writing the importance of self-control. All right, any other thoughts or comments? Appreciate Dennis's. 
So self-control, challenge for us today. What do you think? Always will be. Yep, it will be for me. And hopefully tonight we can look at some of the reasons. You know, sometimes as Christians we're shocked, like, body, why do you want to do that? I know better than this, and you've been trained better. Why are you asking me to do this? You know, we've talked about this. And so it's almost like this discussion you have with your own person. You're like, no, the answer is no, and I've told you. But on some days, you're like, oh, that does sound kind of fun, you know. Well, maybe if somebody doesn't know, we could do it. We could get away with it. And so we, we're challenged. Um, I'm going to turn to the Bible if you want to open your Bibles to Romans 7. And we're going to look at Romans 7. Because Paul has a really interesting discussion in Romans 7. He talks to the church at Rome. And he, and he sort of does this comparison of the law, those who want to be justified by the law, and in this case, the law of Moses, and, and what he's saying is the law serves a very important point because it ends up basically bringing the flesh under condemnation. In other words, we as fallen creatures who are often controlled by the flesh find that the law is a schoolmaster. It takes us to school and it shows us where we have messed up. So nobody can be just under the law. We all stand condemned. That's a good thing because we realize our condemnation. And so it is only through Jesus and the freeing power of his blood and his liberating grace that that gives us true freedom. We'll never be justified under the law. Does that make sense? Under the law of Moses. We'll all stand condemned. The Jews, unfortunately, in the first century church, who were mosaical followers, followers of the laws of Moses, who wanted to impose, we talked about this Sunday night, impose circumcision on new converts, particularly Gentiles. They wanted to be justified under the law of Moses and follow the law of Moses. And so Paul is just saying, basically, uh, let's begin in verse 14. Let me take my glasses off here. Uh, Okay, he says, um, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. I do not, verse 15, understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want. Can anybody relate to that statement? You're saying, this is what I want to do, but you end up doing something else. He says, I do the very thing I hate. Verse 16. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So he's saying basically the law has made me aware of my own sin. I stand convicted because of the law. He acknowledges in verse 18, I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I can relate to that. I want to do what is right, but because of my lack of self-control, I often do the opposite. I do the very thing that I don't want to do. Verse 19, listen to what Paul says. I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want... It is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. He talks about in verse 23, if you drop down a little bit. uh, I'm actually, he says, um, the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So there's this war going on. Uh, And then he talks about this internal struggle, this war between the spiritual and the flesh, he says, verse 24, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? So let me stop and ask, what do you think he means by this body of death? 
Is, is he saying this body's going to be the death of me? This body will cause me to die? This body will die? What does he mean by this body of death? Anybody have an idea? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting in Romans, Paul writes to the Rome, church at Rome, and he says the wages of sin is what? Death. And how many people have sinned? All have sinned, right? And fallen short of the glory of God. I think that's what he's really saying is this body of death is a body that wants to do what's right, but yet because of sin, it's condemned to death under God's law. So based on my goodness, on my ability to not sin, I stand condemned for, for lack of self-control. And maybe that's why he says in verse 25, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is only through Jesus, through his blood and through his grace, that even though this fleshly body sometimes wins and it often sins, that if I can continue to try to suppress it and overcome it and deny it, that God knows my heart, he knows that I'm trying, and his grace makes up the difference for me. It saves me. It's not based on my goodness and my works. Does that make sense? All right. Anybody have thoughts or comments before we move on? Yes, Dennis. Amen. Yeah, uh, some of that some of that battle certainly is for self. Well, I tell you what, I, I don't know about you guys, but in the Garden of Gethsemane, I see Jesus. There's this huge battle going on between the man of flesh and the man of, of God, that spiritual man. You know, he's, his body is profusely sweating, drops of blood, extreme emotion. Um He's everything, everything in his body is fighting to say, I, Lord, I don't want to do this. I, there's just, is there any other way? Don't make me do this. Don't make me drink this cup. But then I, I love what I see happening, and that is the flesh says, okay, yes, we all are in agreement. We don't want to do this. But the spiritual trumps and says, Father, not my will. Not what this body wants, but what you want. I'm willing to sacrifice this physical body to glorify you, to be in obedience and submission to your will. To me, that's, that's amazing self-control. You know, I think there have been a lot of other men that would have run screaming from the garden and fled and hid, but Jesus stood there boldly and, and addressed those who came to arrest him. All the other disciples fled, right? How many were left with Jesus? But they all, they all left him. They deserted him. Peter followed from a distance, but yet even swore he didn't know. I, I swear I don't know this man. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Who is he to me? He denied him. So we all struggle with, with uh, self-control, whether we want to admit it or not. Now, I will say that I think uh, we as, as fleshly creatures, we're pre-wired or programmed in different areas of sin. It, it's hard for us. My struggle may not be your struggle, but we're all wired to struggle somewhere and somehow. Some of us have issues with alcohol. Some of us have issues with um, uh, obsessive behavior, uh, compulsive behavior, or maybe drugs or gambling or uh, womanizer or maybe some of us are adrenaline junkies and we drive too fast, you know. Uh, some of us are into leisure and entertainment, you know, at all cost. Some of us want bragging rights. Some of us are workaholics. Some of us struggle in some area, but we all struggle with something. Yes? Yeah. 
Yeah, interesting. Tiger was going fast. No skid marks. So don't know what caused him to go off the road, but it looks like speed was a factor, right? Yeah, his career probably just ended in a matter of a few seconds. So sad. All right, any thoughts or comments? Self-control. All right, let's go to the next page. Now, I have another observation. Uh, number two, God asks us to give up self-gratification. And that's a hard thing. He wants us to become sanctified or holy. One of the things we've talked about during last Sunday, and we'll talk about again this Sunday, the idea of what is holiness. What does it mean to be set apart for a holy purpose? So the idea of us gratifying the flesh is completely opposite to being holy, to being sanctified in this earth, uh, to be God's people. Somebody read Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. I'm going to ask you guys to do some reading for me. Philippians 2, 13, and then somebody else, if you'll turn to Romans 6, just raise your hand and I'll get you to read a few verses from Romans 6. And then I need another person to read Romans 8. So if you'll raise your hand if you've got Romans 8. All right, who's got Philippians 2? All right, thank you, Warren. 13, yes, sir. Okay, now notice it says in verse 13, it is God who works in you. God is not allowed to enter into us, to indwell us, and his spirit to reign in us if the flesh is in control. You know, Galatians 5, it gives a list of the, the, the deeds of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit. But a human body can't have both in control at the same time. Does that make sense? You can't allow the flesh to be um, in control, but yet have the Holy Spirit working in you and, and the fruits of the Spirit. So you got to decide who is in charge. It is God who works in you both to will and work for his good pleasure. There's a battle going on, and we have to let the spiritual win. Sometimes the spiritual doesn't win. Sometimes the flesh wins. And, and when the flesh becomes a habitual, routine lifestyle, then all of a sudden we have gone over to the dark side and we're an errant Christian who needs to repent. Does that make sense? We're all going to slip. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to sin. That's because we're human. Who's got Romans 6? Do, do, do. Okay, Dennis, read Romans 6.6. 6. Yeah, verse 6. Ooh, the old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So you can kind of see there that we can't allow sin to reign and control us, not if we want the spirit to be victorious. It has to be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, slaves to sin. I've been crucified with Christ. Um, so true. Drop down, if you will, to verse 11 through 14, Dennis. And thank you, Thomas, for putting up those scriptures. That's a big help for me. Uh, verse 11 through 14. Okay, you're not under law, but under grace. And then finally, if you'll drop down to verse 22, Dennis. Verse 22, I appreciate that. Yeah. 
Yeah, go back to 22 there, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, but now that you have been set free from sin, how are we set free from sin? What? Okay, when we make that confession by faith, we're immersed in the waters of baptism. We're told that that faith, that, that uh, water of, of uh, regeneration washes away the sin. It's an, it's an a miracle, uh, an act of God where we respond to him by faith. We're washed of our sins. Then we become, and this is a, a concept a lot of people don't like, if the flesh no longer controls us, we must become a slave not to ourselves, but to someone else voluntarily. You remember we studied the word doulos, an indebted slave, a voluntary slave. Doulos is an Old Testament concept where a person would give themselves to their master. The master says, I free you. I don't want to be free. I want to live here. I want to serve you for the rest of my life. I want to be an indentured servant. Can I be your doulos, your slave? And so he would pierce his ear, the lobe of his ear, with an awl, and that would show that he's an indentured servant voluntarily. He's free to go any time, but he chose to live with the master. That's what we are. We're a doulos. We have become a slave of God voluntarily. When we do that, notice that it produces a certain fruit in us, not death, but the fruit of sanctification, to be set apart, holy, and eternal life. So it takes these things to be God's sanctified, holy, saved people, not to be slaves of the flesh, but to control ourselves and be slaves of God, and a concept that is not very appealing to the world. All right, we haven't read Romans 8 yet, have we? Anybody got Romans 8? Okay, Brian, thank you. Read verses 4 through 11. Romans 8, 4 through 11. So I, begin, I think we can begin to see in our study tonight that the flesh and the spirit are mutually opposed to one another. They're at war. There's constant war going on between the two. And a Christian who's walking through this life will be continually tempted and struggle and even sometimes stumble with sin, with the flesh. But we get up, we brush ourselves off, we keep going. We ask God to forgive us. Uh, we might even want to confess this sin to someone else that we know well and trust. But that's what we do. We continually put to death the, the flesh and the body, and we allow the spirit to reign in us. I won't read Galatians 2.20, but you're familiar with the passage, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And so the idea is that we're dead to self, but alive in Christ. Okay, another observation about self-control. Um, things that help us be more self-controlled, and one of those is discipline. How would you define discipline? Anybody? What is discipline?
Mm -hmm. Learn from your mistakes, yeah. Not repeat those mistakes. Discipline, I think, Sean, is, is that ability to say no, you know, to things that pop in our mind, maybe to set long-term goals. I think of an Olympic athlete who trains has to be extremely disciplined. You know, they may want to eat that big tub of ice cream, you know, or sleep in one day or take it easy one weekend, but they know they've got to train, 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 discipline their body, eat, exercise, push, build muscle. They have to continually do things to give them that extreme edge. Most people don't realize how much time an Olympic athlete spends each day training. Incredible amount of discipline. Dennis, you had your hand up. Right. Yes. Two people, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, my dad used to talk about that in his preaching. Uh, he would, he would, he would sort of paint this contrast of the old man that was buried in baptism. You know, the old body of flesh that we left buried in the in the watery grave. And he and he would warn people. He said. All right, you new Christians out there, you know, those of you been converted into Christ and you're now walking in Christ. He said, one day, there's going to be a knock on your door. And you'll open up the door and to your surprise, guess who it is? It's the old dead man. The one that you buried in that watery grave of baptism, the man of the flesh. He goes, hey, you remember me? Yes, I do. Well, let's go have some fun. Enough with this good goody two-shoes lifestyle. Let's go back and do the stuff we used to do. I miss you. Well, I miss you too, but I said no to that man. So, oh, come on. Nobody's going to know. And so some Christians revert to that old lifestyle thinking that they can be a Christian, but yet live and engage in that old fleshly lifestyle. He said, but there's a problem. When you play with dead people, you stink. Think about that. When you hang out with dead people, you smell like death. So while you're sitting in church, people are like, what's that, what's that smell? You been around something dead? Not me? Nope. You see, after a while, people are going to figure out you've been around the dead man. That's a very graphic illustration, but it's a good point. Some Christians who are sanctified, who are pure and holy, think that they can fool everybody and play with that old fleshly man, the one that was buried. But if you spend time with that person, it's not going to make you pure. It will make you impure. It will make us wretched and foul. So, discipline. It's not enjoyable. Discipline makes us put certain things in perspective. Uh, discipline makes us set limits. Uh, we don't like being told no. You can't do that or have that. So who or what guides us into the proper boundaries? If you could bring up Proverbs 3, verse 11, Thomas. Proverbs 3, 11. Let's read that text. I appreciate Thomas's scriptures. I see here Glenn wrote a comment, so we'll read what he has to say. Um, discipline is not yielding to sin. Uh, it's easier said than done. Discipline, yeah, I, I agree, Glenn. Okay, Proverbs 3.11, my son... Uh, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. 
Now, in the Old Testament, what are some classic examples of the discipline of God? Anybody? Think of them in the Old Testament. Did God discipline in by anybody in the Old Testament? Okay. What was Moses' punishment? Yeah. I, I, you know, my heart goes out to Moses. Of all the people who I could say, I understand Moses. I'd probably not beat the rock. I'd beat the people with my staff. You know, I probably would have said when God said, stand back, Moses, let me destroy him. I'm like, Lord, give me a minute. I'm going to run away, and you just have at it, right? Man, he was one of the most patient, humble men. But yet God had to make an example out of Moses because he was obviously disobedient when he struck the rock. I believe, was it Horeb? Anyway, when he was supposed to speak to the rock, he struck it, and uh, it brought forth water. He was not allowed to enter the promised land, was he, Bill? That's right. He could go up and stand up there and look at it. And I think uh, technically Moses maybe visited the promised land after he was dead. Mount of Transfiguration. But uh, that was his punishment. What was another example of Old Testament discipline or punishment? What was King David? Is that what you were saying? Okay. What specifically were you thinking of? The son died? Okay. Yep. Absalom rebelled against his father. Absalom, Absalom, my son, Absalom. Well, I tell you one I think of is uh, Nadab and Abihu. That ring a bell? They used unholy fire. We're going to talk a little about them in our holiness uh, sermon series. Nadab and Abihu. It cost them. Yeah, yeah. There, there was a man who took God's name in vain, and he was punished by death. Um. All kinds of examples. You had Korah's rebellion, remember? Those who had risen up and, and rebelled against the tribe of Levi and Moses, they wanted to basically create a, a religious coup and take over. God said, all right, everybody, back up. Back away from these tents and all their livestock and people. And what happened to those people in Korah's rebellion? What? Yeah, the earth opened up. It says they were buried alive. Went right down in the ground. There's just all kinds of examples. The people murmured and complained against the Lord, and he sent serpents out, and they bit him. And a lot of people died. Uh, look at David when he numbered Israel. He numbered all the fighting men. Was that a little bit of a discipline? How many hundreds of thousands? Adam and Eve in the garden, yeah, Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man, look at the consequences. So, there's just so many examples of discipline in the Old Testament. Now, what can we expect in terms of discipline in the New Testament? What do you think? That's a little bit of a shift in thinking. Here we are under the law of grace, a merciful God, a loving God, but does he still discipline us in the New Testament? Yes, okay, How? Anybody have some thoughts or ideas? Yeah, sometimes uh, we... Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you'll see uh, a, a, an actual congregation carry out discipline on a brother or sister who is living in open sin. They refuse to repent, uh, and so you basically call them out from a public setting. If, if they've been approached privately and, and refuse to repent, but yet they want to continue to be a part of, of the congregation and be actively involved and be included in, in activities, then you say, no, no. No, you're going to be in spiritual time out, and we're going to alert the congregation as to your behavior. Uh, Jim Olinger mentioned in his text just a moment ago 
One of the disciplines in the Old Testament was 40 years in the desert for lack of faith. All those uh, over a certain age fell in the wilderness. Man, there's just so many examples of discipline, so many examples. So um, I appreciate the fact that one time uh, Paul had to rebuke Peter, didn't he, in the New Testament? He disciplined him. Anybody recall what? What? Yes, sir. Yes. He withdrew himself from the Gentile brethren because these particular Jews, because Gentiles had not been circumcised, they didn't want to include them as brethren and didn't associate with them. And so Peter also was caught up in this. I think Barnabas was caught up in this too, wasn't he? Yeah, even Barnabas. Paul had to confront Peter to his face and rebuke him. He disciplined him. So these things take place. Somebody read Hebrews 12, if you would. Turn over to Hebrews 12, verses 3 through 11. Hebrews 12, 3 through 11. This talks about discipline. We're almost out of time, but I sure have enjoyed our discussion tonight. Hebrews 12, 3 through 11. I'll just read it, and uh, we can let Thomas advance it. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Verse 5, And have you forgotten... The exhortation that addresses you as sons, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us. We respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may Share his holiness. Finally, verse 11, for the moment, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I don't know about you, but I can relate to verse 11 because when I was little, discipline was painful for me. I remember it well, holding my backside and... uh, shedding a few tears, but it yielded uh, a peaceful fruit. I knew I was loved because I was disciplined by my parents. What did you say, Gentry? You didn't think so at the time, right? You didn't appreciate discipline. You didn't really feel loved, did you? I hear you. Think about it in the Old Testament. When God put all kinds of boundaries on his own people, he put boundaries on their dress, he put boundaries on the mountain as it rumbled and lightened, Uh, he put boundaries in the Ark of the Covenant and the room where it resided, Holy of Holies, he had holy fire and there were boundaries on that flame and how it would burn, when it would burn and and, and how it was lit. Nadab and Abihu obviously violated that law. Here's some things, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go very quickly. Some things to help us in self-control. Maybe I should say things that might help me in self-control. Number one, prayer, meditation, and quiet time. Slow down and meditate on spiritual things. Pray about the things that you need help with to be more disciplined. Two, study the Word of God. Read each day. Choose good companions. 
Number four, attend church regularly and listen. Be attentive. Number five, goal setting. Find positive directions to attain in your life and set goals to get there. Number six, look to spiritual role models. Find somebody that you respect and love. Certainly look to Jesus, number seven. Number eight, seek help for persistent fleshly cravings. Things like confession, counseling, accountability groups. Number nine, limit your worldly influences. By this I mean watch carefully what you put into your mind through television, movies, concerts, music, etc. Guard your hearts. All right, the last thing I wanted to mention is that when uh, we are disciplined and self-controlled, we have greater endurance and power. And, and if you read our passage uh, in Peter, you'll see um, that we have better self-control when we are disciplined. Well, we're out of time. Thanks for your comments tonight, for your input, discussions. I hope this discussion on self-control made some sense. I know I needed it because I always struggle with self-control. So, um, all right, and next week, if you'll go to the next topic, Thomas, on self-control, steadfastness. We're climbing up the mountain about halfway. We've looked at faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control. Next week, steadfastness. Thank you.
How's everybody doing tonight? It's been uh, an interesting seven days, hadn't it, between last Wednesday night and tonight. Uh, huge temperature difference. Uh, Sean, during Bible class, brought up Tiger Woods. I thought, boy, what an interesting story. I'm not a, a huge Tiger Woods fan. I mean, he's certainly noteworthy as a professional golfer. He's overcome a lot of adversity, but I thought as many challenges as he's faced in his life, this may be uh, one of the biggest to have a, a, a life-altering, serious, serious injury to both legs, especially when you're a professional golfer preparing just weeks away from the Masters. So for most people, this would be a crushing, uh, very depressing type of injury. Uh, it might even make some contemplate suicide. Um, but I just want to say that there's a difference between people of the world and people of God, I, in my opinion. People in the world and people of God, because anytime things that are horrible or difficult that happen to God's people, we tend to have a, our roots in something much more deeper and spiritual, and that is God himself, who can give us a peace that the world cannot. Now, I don't know if Tiger is a religious person. You know, he may be. But I know that if something horrible, uh, life-changing, devastating happened to me, that I, I can tap into to God and other fellow Christians to get me through it. So I'm thankful uh, that if something like that catastrophic happens, I have God to help me. And in the long run, this physical body, even if it were to cease to be, that's not the end, right, church? We know that if we die tomorrow, that there's more to life. There's something much greater that God has promised us that we haven't seen but yet is real and waiting for us. So I just, uh, he was on my heart, and certainly we want to remember him and pray for him and his family and his tragic injury. Um, I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but I'm thankful that, that I have God to help me. We're going to sing an invitation song. Brian's going to lead us. And, um, and if you need to respond, maybe you're going through a type of crisis or difficulty in your life. Uh, Brian's getting ready to read a, an announcement in a few moments as he prays. No, Howard's going to lead us in a song. Brian's going to pray. Brian's going to share with us uh, an announcement about um, one of our former members who's going through a crisis in their life. But uh, if you need to respond tonight, we ask you to stand and sing, and, and Howard will lead us in our song. Days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today, leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Be seated, please. Thank you, Howard. Just a couple of quick announcements tonight. Uh, we certainly want to remember all of our group that are heading out Friday morning at CYC, and they'll be gone this weekend, and uh, I'm sure a very spiritually uplifting event. What time does the bus leave out Friday morning? Eight eight thirty. Okay, so bus rolls at eight thirty, and that's here at the at the building. Okay, 
So remember all of our adults and young people that will be traveling. CYC, uh, Lobwood Christian Camp, 5th Annual Picking and Ribs Dinner. That's a drive through It's going to be held March 6. Meals will be available for pickup from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Tickets are $25. You can pitch, uh, purchase those from Judy Wallace. And if you need more information, there's also a flyer. I understand there'll be multiple pickup locations for those. Um, for those. Ticket sales are done? Okay, ticket sales ended. And uh, see, Judy, if you have any other questions. All right. Uh, any other announcements? Family news. Violet Key's sister. Okay. Okay. She's in the hospital. All right, thank you. Anybody else? What's our count tonight? 75. Okay, if there's no more announcements, we'll uh, be dismissed by Brian. He's going to lead us in prayer. He has one announcement uh, he's going to share with us, and then we'll be led in prayer. Many of you remember Bailey Long and her family, uh, the previous member here. Uh, she's flying back to the States tomorrow to help her parents, uh, Steve and Diane Williams in Ohio. Uh, Steve is in the ICU with pneumonia, and Diane is having COVID symptoms. So please keep them in your prayers. We you bow in, please. Most gracious and loving Heaven Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to gather tonight in your name and to study another portion of your word and just pray that everything that's said and done here tonight is in complete accordance to your word and help us to remember the things that we learn in our classes tonight and help us to read and study your word daily that we might be the Christian examples you'd have us be and We'll be able to share your good news with others, spread your gospel throughout this community and throughout the world. Just so thankful for the progress of some of our sick and those who have been absent and had procedures recently and been able to be restored and be back with us. And ask your continued blessings upon each and every one on our prayer list, uh, specifically uh, Bailey Long as she flies back to the states and please be with uh, her mom Steve uh, uh, her mom Diane and her dad Steve as they're having health issues pray that you'll please bless them with a recovery soon if it be your will pray father for uh, Violet Key's sister Nancy Balthrop who has COVID just pray that you'll please be with the doctors and nurses attending to her that she'll get better soon. Pray, Father, for all those that I haven't mentioned. Please uh, continue to be with each and every one, especially those who've lost loved ones. Please comfort and strengthen them as only you can. Father, we ask you please be with our adults and children that will be going to CYC on Friday. Pray that you'll give us a, a safe trip, help us to have a very uplifting and uh, spiritual uplifting and just pray that you'll be with all those uh, who will be traveling uh, throughout various places please uh, be with all the efforts that are being made uh, all the speakers and all the different uh, college representatives that will be there and just pray that you'll keep everyone safe Father we pray that you'll be with each of us throughout the rest of this week and just help us to do those things that are pleasing and acceptable to you. Please keep us safe till we meet again. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.